Welcome back to our series about DAS Studio, DAS Studio 101. I'm your gracious host, Javis Lewis, and in this episode, we're gonna talk about cameras. And that's kind of a springboard to making handsome looking pictures with DAS Studio. So cameras are kind of the virtual windows into our scene, and they will lead us on in the next few installments into surfaces and lighting and rendering. And we're gonna to have to branch off because we're having to deal with two types of rendering engines, both of which are being influenced by different types of lights and different types of surfaces. But for this installment, for cameras, this is going to be applicable to both 3D Light as well as iRay. And we're going to talk about, as well as uh, OpenGL, by the way. And we're going to talk more about the differences between the two render engines in an upcoming video. But for now, it's all about cameras and what to do with them, how they work, and how the fundamentals of cameras are implemented in DAS Studio. Let's look at assembling a quick scene rather than looking constantly at primitives. Let's put some real life objects in. I'm a member of the DAS Platinum Club and they give you a little freebie once every week. And this week's freebies are under the props folder in my case and they're called the Sleek Lounge Furniture. I'll put a link to this product into the description. And if we open that up in the Smart Content tab, we come up with uh, props and the props have several items here they've got they're just a collection of bits so it's not a complete scene it's kind of up to you to build the scene with it and it's almost like using primitives but they look a little bit more handsome so there we go they're available as both 3d light and iray materials i could also just type in iray at the top here and then i'll filter out all the iray objects that whittles my list down a little bit so that's a good idea i'm going to bring in the sleek launch chair here that's in the middle let me zoom out a little bit here in my perspective view. That is technically already a camera that we're looking through here, the perspective view. But I'll talk about that more in a moment. Objects load in the center of the screen and to make them assemble into a scene, if I would uh, load another object, it will also load into the center so they kind of overlap each other. So what I'm going to do is just twist this to the side and then just take that little triangle here to move that object to the left a little bit. Maybe turn that around like so. Then I'll bring in the sleek launch sofa. Select that and do the same thing. Turn it to the right and move it over. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Then move it over just with a little triangle selected. Not easy to select sometimes. Move it over here. And perhaps turn around like so. Kind of a two person scene there. There's also several kinds of tables and stools. Maybe I'm gonna use this one here, sleek launch table number three. That's almost at the correct position. Put it there in between the two and then they can sit down and have a glass of wine here. Perhaps this needs to be, needs to spin around here a little bit more and then this can move into here. That's, that's kind of a nice scene. There's also a wine glass and a wine bottle. So let's bring the wine bottle in, select that and just move it high. We're gonna have a look at how to place that properly in a moment, just to put that here on the table somewhere and there's a full wine glass as well so let's put that in too with the wine glass selected let's just put that somewhere on the table ish and it's probably not going to have the correct height so for that we can change our perspective view to the front view and then look at where these things are so i'm pretty confident that the chairs and the table they're kind of on level with the with the ground plane already, but I guess the wine bottle and the wine glass, I've kind of eyeballed that. So with that selected, I'm gonna select the wine bottle first and then move it up a little bit so that it just about intersects with the tabletop here, with the glass tabletop. Same with the wine glass. Move that just about here. And because we're dealing with two people, I guess I'm gonna go and duplicate the wine glass so that we have two instances of that. Technically, it's a copy, but we, that's an advanced topic, so we're going to deal with that maybe on another, in another episode. Under Edit, you'll find Duplicate, and we've talked about this before, Duplicate Nodes and Hierarchies. In this case, it's a single object with no other objects parented to it, so it doesn't matter which one I use. I'm going to use Duplicate Node, and there's my second wine glass, and with that selector, I'm just going to move that slightly further forward here. I'll go back to my Perspective View, and place those objects a little bit more palatable. So this is maybe his glass and this is maybe 
her glass here and perhaps the wine bottle is kind of in the middle ish of the of the table so that's our scene a pretty little scene and a simple scene as well so one thing that you may have noticed between the perspective view and the front view that I've just had a look at is that right now we can't really tell what is further away from one another. Right now all we can see is all objects kind of bang in the center but we're not angling over so we, we, we can't get an idea of perspective here. Hence we can't really tell if this is actually an orthographic view or a, or a perspective view. We often refer to these as orthographic views but the difference between an orthographic and a perspective view, and this is all related to cameras, that's why I'm mentioning it, the difference between those two things is that one draws the perspective with a kind of drawing trick, it's like an artist's trick that artists have employed for many years, it's called foreshortening. And the perspective view that employs it for us and you can tell foreshortening by looking at these lines on the grid here all the lines that go parallel to one another from the front to the back and you'll notice that they kind of converge into the back can you see that this line here between these these two lines this line here is shorter then that line over here, or let's say this line is shorter than that line. And that is kind of a drawing trick to draw objects that are smaller in the back and objects that are further closer to us are slightly larger. So objects that are further away appear smaller in a perspective view and objects that are closer to us appear slightly larger. And depending on the focal length of a camera, this effect is more pronounced or less pronounced. So if you look at a real life camera like a digital SLR or movie camera and you have a zoom lens on it in which you can put that to a really wide angle then things look sometimes very squashed sort of weird and if you come closer to people they've got really large heads but then if you move further away from these people and then zoom in you still show the person at the same size but all the perspective features are more flattened out so to say and that is exactly that difference that this this kind of this perspective changes depending on the focal length of your camera and I'm talking about this because in the perspective view, we don't really have a numeric value to have a look at that. We can simulate this effect. And one of my Patreon supporters actually just told me about that. Mr. Batsu, a.k.a. Dream Labs. Is that right? Dream Labs Studio. There we go. Uh, you can right click the little zoom icon here and then move the mouse further in or further out. And that is the effect that I'm talking about. And if you disregard the furniture for a moment and have a look at the very last line on the grid that's drawn here, then you'll see that this is exactly that effect. At one point, these things are really distorted and are now to a point where the 3D manipulator is completely distorting here as well. And that though that's kind of foreshortening. And the more we go into that, the less this effect becomes. But then also the more zoomed in our scene becomes. And I'm talking about this effect because there is a way for us to switch this off. That not happening in our scene, that being switched off, that's called an orthographic view or an orthographic camera. So let's demonstrate this with an example of actually creating a camera and then switching this on and off. And then I can show you the difference exactly there. So to create a camera for our scene, usually what I do is I frame the scene up with my perspective view so that I can get a bit of a sense of what I'd like to show. Perhaps this is kind of my wide shot that I'd like to see then. If I were to set this up in real life for an interview, I'd have a person sitting here, a person sitting there, and I'd probably shoot this with three or four cameras, one shooting kind of a wide shot and then one focusing on this person and one focusing on that person. So right now this is the wide shot and one thing is if I don't create a camera, save the scene, close Das Studio, go to bed and tomorrow I want to keep working on the scene, I load Das Studio in, my perspective view is going to look different. It's kind of 
going to look as a default setup. It's, it's not going to be the same scene that I've set up. And that would be a shame because I may have spent a lot of time setting this up exactly as I wanted. So that's why we can create cameras. So to have multiple perspectives, but also to save what we've just framed up. It's very important to remember that, even if you only have a single view that you want to show. So what you can do to create a camera is two things. You can either head over to the menu and say, create new camera. That's one way of doing it. Or you can click that little camera icon with a plus sign. The result is the same. A little dialog box opens up and that allows you to name the camera. Camera one, if you don't do anything else, and the next camera is going to be named camera two. But you can also name it. Uh, this is the white shot. And then the next one will be framing Freddy. And the other one is framing Lisa or whatever. Um, the options are not that important. They're largely self-explanatory. I always click this one here, copy active view. Even though newer versions of Dash Studio, I believe apply default settings, will already create a camera looking exactly like what we've just framed up with the perspective view. But that's not always the case. I kind of don't really trust it. And I'm kind of a belt and braces old style kind of guy. So I'm always selecting this one here, copy active view. And that'll create a camera in my scene view. And it'll look exactly like what my perspective view looks like at the moment. So if I switch this over from perspective view to camera, I now see more or less exactly the same scene. But look what happens if I switch to my perspective view and then frame up the shot from a different angle. So perhaps now I'm going to go and uh, zoom in and I'll, I'll show this person close up. Then I could go ahead and create another new camera. Again, copy the active view, perspective view, and hit accept. And now I've got two cameras here. And the cool thing about this is now that I can switch back to camera one, which will show me exactly what I framed up before. And now I can go and frame up camera two. And now I can see what I've just framed up in the second camera. And it also then leaves my perspective view free to do other things. So I can either now frame up a third camera if I wanted to, or I can just go and spin this around and look at my objects and use this more like as my run around camera to place objects in the right position. So if I wanted to move close and I needed to pose a character or I needed to make sure a hand is on an object or whatnot, then this is what I can use the perspective view for. That's kind of my recommendation to you. I would never, I would recommend not to use the perspective view for rendering. Even though you can do it, you can just hit render now and it'll produce a picture. The issue is that if you really like that framing and you want to lock those values in and kind of save them to, so that you can go back to them, you have to create a camera for that. Now with the camera selected, I can now do very interesting things. So let me show you. Uh, let's go to camera one. That's my, my wide shot here. If I am displaying camera one, I can just switch uh, the framing that it's, it's uh, looking at uh, just like this, just that, like I did with the perspective view. All I need to make sure is that I'm selecting this camera and then whatever I'm changing here will be preserved in that camera. So if I now go back to camera two, then that's still preserved. I go back to camera one, then what I've just done is preserved. But that's not the only way I can manipulate my camera. So I can also go to the perspective view and uh, this is my camera here. This is camera one. This here is camera two that's now shown. I can also move the camera with the regular manipulator. And that's where a second viewport usually comes in handy. I can use either my auxiliary viewport here, which I can also switch over to camera one and use this as my perspective view or vice versa. And now I can move the camera, whoops, I can move the camera up or down. And I will see, well, obviously if I, was that the wrong camera? That's oh, the wrong camera, isn't it? Sorry. If I select the, this is, this is camera one here. Sorry about that. So this is camera one. If I now go and move this camera up or down, I can see the result in my other viewport. Can you see that here? I can do whatever with the camera and that'll change my framing. So that's, you know, interesting to notice. I'm mentioning this because there are a few things that we can do with this camera that usually don't come up with a regular 3D manipulator. There's a funky cube here and there's also a little ball here and we'll, we'll find out other things in this video. So that is also possible.
And then of course, the third way of manipulating my camera is the parameters. The parameters for the camera come up in two different positions in Dash Studio. One is of course the parameters tab and with the camera selected I can head over there to the parameters tab and I have the regular things like the transformations for translation, rotation and scale. I've also got my miscellaneous tab in which I can point the camera at something specific. So for example if I have a close-up of a character then I can go and point that camera to an object in my scene. So for example, my character's face, so that I'm always, no matter what I do with the camera, if I move it around, it'll always adjust itself to look at the character. Not that the framing is always perfect, but it's one thing that you can do. Good thing to remember. Like we pointed lights at figures before, now we can actually point cameras at people or at objects as well. That's nice. So those are the general terms. And the other ones, well, we're going to deal with them in a moment. Uh, they're very interesting. Well, a few of them I'll cover in detail. Others I'll let you explore for yourself. I just wanted to mention that these parameters from the parameters tab, just like the parameters for any object that you select in your scene, are also available from a specific tab that only deals with cameras. And I've parked mine over here. That's the cameras tab. And it also has these values, exactly like on the parameters tab, but it's kind of doubled and it's on a second tab. Now I find that useful because sometimes I use the parameters tab for an object that's selected in my scene, for example, the chair or a character or whatever I, uh, I'm, I'm framing up with. And then I need to quickly change a camera parameter. So rather than going into my scene tab, changing from the launch chair to the camera and then changing those and then changing back to the launch chair. I leave the launch chair selected, have all its parameters showing in the parameters tab. And then I go over to the cameras tab and just quickly change a setting on a camera. So that's just the, my way of working. And I found that very, very easy uh, if I wanted to change something specific about a camera. For example, switch the headlamp on or off. We're going to talk about the headlamps more in the upcoming video about lighting. So that's how I like to work. And this is how the parameters for the camera or in fact for any object can be found sometimes in other places. And cameras is a good example. And I recommend you use that camera tab in addition to the parameters tab. To bring that up, by the way, it's as uh, simple as going over to window, panes, and then you find the cameras tab here. Make it show up and then dock it in your favorite spot. So with my camera one selected and looking at camera one here and perhaps maybe looking at uh, camera two over here, let's do that. We're looking at camera one in the general viewport here. Uh, let me frame up something like a, like a wide shot like this. Let me show you some of the cool things that the camera tab can do or some of the parameters that the, that the cameras can do. I think the first thing we should be talking about is that right now, I don't really, looking at the camera, I don't really see what is rendered on my image. I could go ahead and switch on the iRay viewport quickly and that'll just take a second and then my scene pops into action. But I really don't know if I hit render, will all of this really be rendered? Well, yes, it does. But what if I wanted to make a portrait that's kind of, you know, that's, that's like that. Or what if I wanted to make a 16 by nine image that's, that's like that. You've seen directors do this a lot in, in movies usually, not in real life, but this is a nice way of looking at what would be appearing on my scene. That's why people look like that. It's kind of a, you know, a full cinema framing. That's kind of an old director's trick, I guess. Well, there is a way to display this type of frame, which is called the aspect frame in Dash Studio. And that can be set in two places. And I'll show you both places just before we get started, before we talk more about what we frame up on our cameras. So one thing that we can do is go to this little context menu here, and we can do this for any viewport. So we can do that if we had two or four viewports, we can do this for every single of these viewports. Click that and then select this option, show aspect frame. And that'll show you a white border around the image. And inside that border, you will see what is rendered and anything outside will not be rendered. And our iRay preview will actually 
take that into consideration when you see the IRA preview. So for example, right now, I don't really see a difference. That's because under my render settings, where this the aspect ratio of what you're rendering can be set, uh, is set to, under general over here, to active viewport. And that means that whichever viewport is active, that's the one with the orange border around here, that's the current pixel aspect ratio that'll be rendered. So in my case, that's just a completely arbitrary 1019 by 927 pixels. That's the final image resolution that if I press render now, then the Star Studio would in fact open a new window and it'll just render that scene in those specific aspect in, in that in that specific pixel aspect ratio with transparency. And DAS Studio does that because that's the size of my active viewport. That's why it does that. So let me cancel this. And uh, I don't want to really, to, I just want to close that. There we go. Uh, if I had, if I switch it to a different viewport, then those uh, dimensions would change. I like to stick with my main viewport here and I like to render something in 16 by 9 in like uh, 1920 by 1080 for example. Good thing we can do that under uh, render settings general there's this dimension preset here which is the global preset so there's also one that can be specific for cameras and we're going to talk about that in a moment. For now we can select our favorite aspect ratio from this wide list of options here so I can select full HD 1920 by 1080 or I can even have 4k if I wanted to or I can just have a general widescreen thing those are just suggestions here I'm going to use the full HD preset and that will draw that white border now that I've just talked about and that also means that these parts of the image are currently not preview rendered only anything that's inside my preview window is rendered so if I zoom in here and I zoom in so close that, uh, say, uh, deliberately part of that couch is not rendered. Then I can see that all this is appearing after a few seconds of a delay in the iRay preview, and all this is not. And that's just our preview so that we can see what is going to end up on our final image when we render this. And that's, of course, depending on what aspect ratio I set. So I could also now go ahead and say, actually, I don't want 1920 by 1080. I like this aspect ratio, which is 16 by nine, but I like to render maybe in, I don't know, 1280 by, and it calculates it for us, 720. So the aspect ratio does not change, but the pixels, the amount of pixels that we're rendering, the size of our final image, that is gonna change. So that's one thing I can do. Or I can pick a different aspect ratio. I can also say constraint proportions. I can set that to off if I wanted to render something really exotic, like, I don't know, 1280 by 912. I can do that. And as soon as I hit enter, then I can see that my aspect ratio is now an interesting 80 to 57. But uh, it's, the, it's the dimensions I want, but the size of the image will change as soon as I hit render. That's how that works. And you can also type in a portrait aspect ratio. So maybe you wanted to have something like 800 by 1200, for example. And that's a nice portrait ratio. Even if you just like these dimensions, it's like two by three. That's, that's what the digital SLRs often use. You can use that. And uh, then you say, actually, now I'd like my image to be something like 2000 wide and I guess 3000 high. In that case, just switch on the constraint proportions, type in one value here, like 2000 in the width, uh, well, 2000 in the width, and then you'll have 3000 in the height. Your viewport isn't going to change, but as soon as you hit render, your image is going to be much larger. So for demo purposes, let's stick with the 16 by 9 for now. Let's just use regular HD. That's, that's okay. And frame up our scene, just like we had before. Now, the interesting thing about cameras is that there's so many interesting little parameters that you can set. You may be in a situation, uh, just to, to finish this off, that you say, yeah, actually, I want to have... Uh, a scene that I'm going to set up and I want three pictures or say two pictures. One is going to be landscape like this, but another one I like to have portrait. And how do I set that up? How do I make sure that I have a second camera that would frame the thing up in portrait? How do I do that? Well, I'm glad you asked because there is a way. Let's have a look at that. Let's go and select our camera two in the scene tab here and also switch over to camera two. 
So this is camera two and say I wanted something like the wine bottle up close and I'd like to frame that up portrait. Then if I do that and if I change the global aspect ratio under render settings, then my other camera's framing would be ruined as well. And I don't really want to do that. I want to I want to have something that that looks portrait here, maybe with the wine glasses and perhaps a character in the background. Well, with the camera selected, either on the cameras tab or once again on the parameters tab, under dimensions, we have something like one innocent looking button that's just currently set to off and that's the local dimensions. And with this thing, we can override what the aspect ratio is set to under the render settings. So if we switch that to on, you'll notice that a lot of other options come up. And right now, there's not much of a change. It's already changed from 16 by 9 to 3 by 2. And we once again, we can pick from the list of aspect ratios what we would like. So perhaps I'm going to use the golden ratio portrait. If I do that, then I get a very portrait thing and I also get my own pixel dimensions here. And now I can frame up my wine bottle and my glasses to my heart's content. Perhaps um, do, it like, uh, do it like that. Maybe further over here, maybe I'm going to go even and uh, take that wine bottle and uh, move it further into the middle so that we can frame both wine glasses up. I don't know, something like that. It's just it's just a little demo. I don't really like the golden ratio that much. I think it's a bit it's a bit too portrait. But uh, again, one of those things. If I select off this and one of those things in the parameters tab is these will change depending on what object is selected and that's where the cameras tab is uh, is kind of more forgiving you can just uh, set that and uh, go back to dimensions and no matter which object object you select in the scene this will never change because it's not context sensitive well it is but you can pick your camera from this list here so perhaps golden isn't exactly what i want perhaps i'd like more something like a, a three by two like this and that's that's uh, landscape now so let's make that two by three there maybe that's something that uh, i like i like slightly better that isn't two by three by the way but hey one of those things you get the drift you get my picture and that's how you can set up two different cameras differently so if we switch back to camera one that'll still adhere to the aspect ratio that's set under the render settings because it currently does not have, if we have a look at that, the dimensions set to on, they're switched to off. So that means the global render settings are being acknowledged, but our camera two certainly does have it switched on and it will render its own dimension, which is nice. So if I switch back to camera two, I can see aspect ratio is different. So that's one very important thing to keep in mind. You can override the aspect ratio that's set in the render settings. Let's have a look at two other things that cameras are really good at. One of them is the perspective thing I talked about earlier. And for this, let me just switch the iRay preview off again and go back to the uh, rendered view, the texture shaded viewport here and frame up my camera slightly like this. So with camera one selected in the scene tab here, either on the cameras tab or in the parameters tab. Let's have a look at the camera setup in the camera tab. There's this thing called perspective. And that's kind of what we expect a regular camera to have. It should render perspective. But there may be other situations in which you don't want the perspective to be rendered, be that for modeling purposes or for, I don't know, weirdness purposes. And if you switch that off, then you can see that something rather weird is happening. To, to really hone that point in, I can also uh, switch that aspect frame off again so that we can see the, the, the whole scene here. So I can still zoom in and out, but I can't seem to tilt my camera anymore, like up and down. That doesn't seem to work anymore, not with the camera controls here anyway. And uh, the reason for that is because now I don't draw the perspective anymore. So perspective is taken out of the equation. This line is exactly the same length as this line. It may not look that, but if you put a ruler to this, it, you, will, you will see that it, it is that. So a cube, for example, would, have we got a cube here? No, we don't. A cube would literally be drawn uh, in, in this weird 
kind of style that, that doesn't really look like a cube, it more looks like a, like a two-dimensional sketch. And that's what happens when the perspective is switched off. This is the same that you can do in Blender uh, with the number five key when you look at it with or without perspective. But in Blender you can even change the perspective. So here I can only do this when the perspective is in fact switched on and then just switch it off if I don't want to see the perspective. And what's happening there is that the foreshortening is taken out of the equation, and that's sometimes helpful for modeling. Speaking of perspective, the ratio in which we apply foreshortening is more or less governed by the focal length of the camera. So right now, the frame width and the focal length are very much related. Think of the frame width as something like the sensor size or the film size on your film camera, or on your digital camera. It's set to 36 because that is usually on a regular 35 millimeter film camera, the diagonal on the 35 millimeter frame. I've always been puzzled about this when I first looked into photography. Why is it called a 35 millimeter frame? And what's this with the diagonal of it being 36 millimeters? What's all that about? Well, what happens there really is that the, the width of the actual film with the perforations from top to bottom, that is 35 millimeters. But if you take the perforation off, then you're left with a slightly slimmer thing. And uh, an actual negative of a 35 millimeter uh, Photo photographic camera is 24 by 36 millimeters in dimensions. So I guess that's where the 36 comes in. I suppose the diagonal would actually be something slightly larger than 36. Anyway, it's one of those things. 36, I guess, is the sensor size. And if I change that, then whatever happens on my photo that I'm shooting here will also change. Likewise, if I change the focal length, then what appears on my film, my digital or whatever, my, my rendering will also change. And let's, let's see what the connection is between those. So in 35 millimeter photography, a focal length of 50 is seen as something of a natural kind of view, I believe. And uh, I think the, the default that DAS Studio applies here is 65, which is, I believe, and don't quote me on this, I think that is the equivalent on a 35 millimeter movie camera, I think, but I'm not entirely sure. It's one of those things. Uh, from what I understand, 50 millimeters on a regular photographic camera is regarded as what we see with our human eyes. Anything below that is regarded as wide angle, and anything above that is regarded as telephoto. So if we use the slider like this, then the position of our camera doesn't actually change. But what does change is in fact this thing, uh, the, the zoom on our camera. So if I go and uh, look at, perhaps I'll look at camera one over here and I look at my perspective view over here and this is the camera we're talking about currently. If I change the focal length, then you can see that this little box here that uh, that appears that's kind of drawn around the scene. This is kind of what I'm what I'm looking at. That's the, the uh, frame, I believe they call it. If you move the focal length, then you see that what is changing here is whatever is being shown on my image. So this shows more than this. So this is a wider perspective than that. And that's how that works. But I could also, if I leave the focal length intact, and let's just say I leave that on, on 50, I can also change the frame width. And that has more or less the same effect on our uh, auxiliary viewport, if you have a look at this. And the geometric distortions are more or less the same. So it's, uh, you can change it in either way. Um, I guess this is kind of depending on what you're used to. I'm used to leaving this static and only ever changing the focal length, but that's just the way I'm used to things here. I can also dolly the camera towards the scene. So if I just hover my mouse over here, then I can do that. You can see that when I scroll my mouse wheel, the camera physically moves closer to the objects. And then if I change my focal length, and just keep doing that, then you see that the perspective is very much distorting here. So now we can see that the camera is very, very close to my subjects, yet I'm still trying to show both 
these objects and you can see what happens as a result. So I, I see that everything is very much distorted. The table is almost an oval now. It's because I'm sitting almost on the top of it and uh, that's how I can do extremely cool effects, uh, especially when characters are involved. I can show more or less of the frame and I can distort objects at will. There we go. I can dolly back and then zoom in and then these effects will be will be much less as I move away from the scene and then zoom in at the same time. It's almost like I'm reaching this point where there's no perspective anymore in the scene. So that's something I can do. I've done another video on my channel which deals with the uh, depth of field and I'm going to I'm going to refer you to that in the comments but just for now I'm going to just touch on that that in the final render if we just render my camera one here uh, using the iRay preview then uh, there is a thing that you can employ which is this which is this effect called depth of field and while we're on the camera tab you can switch that on or off here so uh, the uh, effect of that is that if I were to, maybe I'll actually show you this on camera too, because that's, that's set up like this, isn't it? So I can, I can maybe frame uh, the whole, try and frame all this up. That I've, I've got uh, all these objects in my image, and then I'll add some depth of field to it. And it is fairly quick to do. It's just, you know, knowing how to do it really. So uh, with, the, with the shot framed up and with the camera that you want to employ this on selected, head over to the camera tab and switch on depth of field. And that will now switch this effect on. And all is up to you now to frame up the camera properly. So I can already see that this is being rendered uh, slightly out of focus and the uh, bottle is a little bit fuzzy and all that so it's kind of not set up correctly so in order to do that there are some helper lines that that studio draws in on this so uh, that's probably best seen in the texture shaded view or on a different viewport altogether so let's do let's have a look at the um, perspective view just in the auxiliary viewport and we can see that we've got these these uh, several lines here uh, one at the front one in the middle and one at the back and if I change my focal distance down here in the parameters tab, then I can see that what happens is this is basically the focus that I'm pulling now. And it depends on what object I'd like to have in focus. That's where I need to set that middle plane to. Uh, so say we we'll set that to the bottle. Can you see that here? This is now kind of my focal plane set right onto the bottle. And it appears it's not quite in focus yet. So what's happened there? Well, it depends on how uh, open your f-stop is, your aperture on the camera, and that then renders more or less depth of field. So the smaller this value is, the more blurry my picture will get. Can you see that? If I set that to a lower value, something like say two, then almost the whole picture is blurred. And no matter how hard I try to put anything in focus, I'm not gonna be that successful really. It's probably also the depending on how at which angle I'm going to look at this. But you can see that the depth of field right now is extremely shallow. So these two planes, they're very close together. So what I can do there is either increase my depth of field and make sure that whatever's shown in between that is, is a bit uh, wider, or I can change my focal distance to frame up the object that is dear to me. It's in this case, the bottle. There. So that should do the trick. I've got a little bit of depth of field at the back here, and I get a little bit of depth of field at the front here. But what I'm trying to do is have these objects in focus. So it's a little bit tricky, but those lines, they'll help you do that. And that's how you can render a pretty picture. We haven't talked about lighting because lighting is, of course, very important in photography as well. And we're going to deal with that next. Same as with headlamp, because that's kind of, even though it's on the camera, it is a lighting topic. And we're going to cover that in one of my upcoming videos. That was it for today. I hope this was helpful. I know I've rushed through this a little bit, but I'm already coming up to 40 minutes here. It's one of those things. I don't want to make it too long. Cameras, we can talk about this 
all day long because there's also the blades menu here for example and then of course there's a display menu and there's also the general menu and there's all these kinds of things that can add or remove distortion into the camera so I'm not going to cover that here this is just a basic overview of how you create cameras how you set them up how you create multiple cameras and then when you save your scene you can go back to shots that you've previously set up and that's what I wanted to drive home to you today. That was it. I hope this was helpful. If you like this video, then of course, share it with friends, family and total strangers. And I will see you in the next video. Take care. Bye bye.